and welcome to the LSB 100 uh, Engineering the Future event within our LSB 100 Women in Engineering event series. For now, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Claire Benson. Thank you, Dean. And uh, thanks to everyone joining us today. Uh, my name is Dr. Claire Benson and I'm the curator of this program of events, LSBU 100 Women in Engineering. I'm extremely proud to be able to present this exciting event, Engineering the Future. Engineering research is one of my passions and I know from talking to them that that passion is shared by all of our speakers here today. This evening is part of the centenary celebrating 100 years of teaching women in engineering at London South Bank. Historically, we all know that a number of professions were not seen as girls subjects. Some prestigious professions like law and medicine have been able to shake off that old image, so much so that they now have pretty much equal numbers of men and women in their workforce. But with only 12% of engineers in the UK being female, our profession is lagging behind. And yet, as today's presentations will, I think, demonstrate, there's no reason why women can't be a vital part of the engineering world. Whether, wherever there are problems to be solved, we need problem solvers from all backgrounds, and today we get to meet a few of those. We'll be hearing from women working in and running current engineering projects, who will be telling us about their research work that is shaping the world of tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to thank today's contributors, Dr. Suela Kalici, Christina Kerwin, Alejandra gonzalez Baez, and Dr. Caterina Marquez for using some of their valuable time to share their stories and work with us. So I'd like to welcome you all to LSBU 100. And it's rewarding. Creative, exciting, world-changing, innovation, impact, and solutions. It's diverse, it's life-changing, it's transformational. On a daily basis, I do lots of different things. I perform data analysis and subsurface modeling focusing on data analytics and cognitive computing. I'm involved in research and enterprise projects about sustainability. I make materials that provide solutions to global challenges. I get to use my theoretical knowledge in practical environments and find out how engineers can change the world for the better. I love engineering because it's challenging. It can really help to solve problems at all sorts of levels. I love engineering because it helps me express my creativity and you get to break the barriers. It gives me freedom to deliver positive changes for a better world. I would tell the next generation of female engineers that if you're a lady who wants to make a change in the world, then this is the career for you. We need you. If you want to feel empowered, then engineering is for you. Join the top table. I am a design engineer. I am a computer scientist. I am a petroleum engineer. I am a materials engineer. I am a chemical engineering student at London South Bank University. I really enjoyed that video. I hope you did too. Um, but before I uh, go on and introduce our guests, I'd actually like to tell you a bit about my research and the work that I'm doing at LSBU uh, with a team of people and a team of people from around Europe, actually. So uh, I'll just prepare, show you something I have prepared. I'm from the outskirts of London, a town called Feltham, and I was the first in my family to go to university. So everything since my first day at uni has really been new and foreign. I did a degree in forensic science and absolutely fell in love with fire science and incident investigation as part of that. Because of that, I applied for a PhD in chemical engineering funded by the Ministry of Defence and concentrating on fires in oxygen breathing systems and on aircraft. Since completing that, I've done a range of research work with public and private organisations on different types of fire and explosion hazards, like fire investigation, arson research, uh, research with the nuclear industry. And now I continue to do research on pr fire prevention and firefighting systems in industrial and domestic buildings. But the largest part of my research at the moment is spent leading a work package as part of the Enable H2 project. 
Enable H2 is an, a European funded project to explore the possibility of switching the aviation industry from the current jet fuel to hydrogen fuel. But in order to look properly at hydrogen as a fuel, we can't just look at the aircraft and aircraft systems. We have to examine and assess surrounding issues like airports supporting infrastructure, the economic and environmental impact of that switch, and we also have to look at the safety. The project is a collaboration of quite a number of organizations with different expertise and interests in aviation, in hydrogen, and now in both. So why hydrogen? Well, because the aviation industry is now getting very serious about reducing its environmental impact. Some of that is being driven by the EU and other legislation, but also I think the industry realizes that change is coming and they want to have the best technology first. And based on this analysis from our partners, Cranfield University, the environmental impact of hydrogen is so much lower than any hydrocarbon fuel. At the moment, costs are undeniably higher than conventional jet fuel or drop-in replacements, but there's a huge amount of research on improving hydrogen production and costs are falling every year, making some analysts believe there may be a significant fall in the price in future. The Enable H2 project is structured with work packages on fuel and combustion systems at the top there, a technology evaluation work package to design future aircraft and a roadmap work package to help future projects understand what needs to be done if you're going to make this quite monumental shift to hydrogen fuel. You'll notice that the safety work package feeds into every one of those engineering work packages. So my work and the work of my fire and explosion colleagues here at the London Centre for Energy Engineering is important to everyone else on the project. The important thing to know about my role on the project is that I'm not here to be a technology cheerleader. I don't know that hydrogen's the answer to our fuel issues, but I and my colleagues from LSBU are examining how this fuel could be put into the aircraft industry and where it is being used on our project and elsewhere to make sure it's done safely. So to start with some background on hydrogen. The main combustion product of hydrogen is water. Hydrogen's non-toxic to humans, aquatics, non-carcinogenic, non-corrosive. These are good things from a safety perspective. It has high buoyancy, which means some interesting things later on. I'll explain that later. It has a low viscosity, so it leaks easily. It's only liquid below minus 252.87 degrees Celsius, and it burns at a wide range of concentrations and requires relatively low energy to be ignited at ground level. So less good things from a safety perspective. It's very different to other hydrocarbon fuels. So how do we look at applying this fuel to the aviation industry from a safety perspective? Well, first we look at the history. Now, hydrogen suffers from the visit visibility of a past disaster. I tend to call this the Hindenburg effect. The visibility of that incident resulted in a perception that the gas is definitely more dangerous than other fuels. But is that fair based on that incident? Well, I'd say no. Hydrogen fuel use was first being used at the start of the aviation industry when there was a lot of experimentation and learning going on, not to mention a complete lack of safety culture. Added to that, it was used in airships, which even when they used helium instead of hydrogen, suffered a number of high profile crashes, just not on film. In spite of public perception, hydrogen is used regularly today in space technologies and is being used for new research and development projects such as SpaceX and Skylon. Hydrogen combustion systems have been tested successfully in the past, such as the Tupolev 155, which used purging or inerting to remove the risk from possible hydrogen leaks. There have been a couple of detailed safety studies looking at hydrogen feasibility and safety implications in the past, and they generally found that, though not easy, safety was not a barrier to technology introduction, though there were knowledge gaps identified. So at the start of this project, we carried out a preliminary hazard assessment. The analysis was performed on theoretical systems shown in the diagram on the left here, 
and using a standard process on the right, we identified hazards, incident outcomes, and the severity and likelihood of incidents given existing mitigations we already have at our disposal. And here are the major safety issues we identified around those hydrogen systems. Now that probably seems like quite a bad list. Most could lead to a catastrophic failure without some kind of mitigation. But actually, all of those hazards, aside from the cryogenic issues, have to be dealt with in current aircraft design. And all the hazards are dealt with in the chemical engineering industry and space industries currently. So what we're doing is trying to put those disciplines together to work out how to deal with those risks and in the end assess if it's possible to make a cost effective and safe aircraft. But as well as the hazards, we have also found that hydrogen may have some advantages in some contexts. I've already mentioned the buoyancy of hydrogen. This analysis by Brewer shows that in a crash scenario, hydrogen in green disperses upwards, while methane and jet fuel are more likely to spread along the ground. The ability of liquid hydrogen to evaporate and disperse largely upwards could be a real benefit in a major leak or crash scenario. You also don't get the spill damage from hydrogen as with hydrocarbon fuels, particularly liquids. The way hydrogen burns could also be an advantage. Liquid hydrogen burns far quicker than jet fuel. So if you turn off the supply, the fire will be short lived. And hydrogen flames effectively give us less heat. Hydrogen flames emit in the UV region, largely, and this appears to be absorbed by the atmosphere around the flame. That means danger is largely concentrated right in the flame and not around it. We also had a really interesting hazard assessment day at Heathrow Airport with a number of industry stakeholders. Overall, it was a very positive and pragmatic day and the industry was far more receptive to hydrogen fuel than I was expecting. On safety, it was judged that for storage, taxiing, takeoff and landing, many of the issues and mitigations would actually be similar with hydrogen as to now or to other industries. Scale and infrastructure was the biggest concern for storage. Fueling had the largest number of unknowns. How could fuel be supplied? By vehicles, perhaps initially, and, and then in the long run, perhaps hydrogen could be brought in by robots or pipes in the longer term. And the larger scale cryogenic and fire hazards are still a concern. Firefighting was an area that would most require a large degree of change. Protocols, training, equipment would all have to change. And that's for the whole fire service, as anybody might be called to help in the event of a major incident. However, the fire service hydrogen specialist on the day seemed confident that based on new advances in hydrogen firefighting, that the risks are manageable. There are still a number of knowledge gaps that need to be filled in order to say that hydrogen is a safe aviation fuel. We're just completing work looking at large scale hazards related to hydrogen releases and ignition to better understand and assess risks and set safety distances at places like airports and storage facilities. Next, we'll be looking at hydrogen flammability in our state of the art apparatus, Boreas, you can see on the right, which can reduce pressure and temperatures to altitude type conditions. And our work at LSBU and on the Enable H2 project will continue to explore more of these issues in future. Here are some references. Uh, thank you for listening. I can be contacted at London South University and you can read more about the Enable H2 project at that web address. Thank you very much. So thank you for listening. Um, next, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Swela Kalucci, and her talk on the Nano 2D Lab. Swela. Yes. Oh, yes, I'm on the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. It's such a pleasure being here today. Uh, delighted to share the research of Nano 2D Lab with all of you. Uh, a little bit of introduction about myself. I am Associate Professor in Materials uh, Engineering here at LSBU. Uh, I originally studied at Queen Mary University in London, where I completed a degree in chemistry, followed by a PhD in materials chemistry. 
Prior to joining LSVU, I worked as a researcher at University College London. I lead Nano2D Lab, and we're currently working on uh, several research projects that look at the synthetic approaches to make advanced functional materials using uh, supercritical water. Our group mission is to provide materials with aiming uh, to provide solution to global challenges in energy storage, biomedical and environmental related areas. So uh, the group was recently uh, selected as a finalist in uh, Institute of Chemical Engineer in the Global Worlds. And I will very delighted I am here today and I would really like to share with you the exciting work that researchers in my group Research Nano 2D lab focuses on designing and engineering advanced functional materials using a target-oriented approach in providing solution to major global challenges in water treatment, environmental energy storage and biomedical related areas. Energy storage, wireless communications, water treatment processes, environmental, enhanced oil recovery, 2D materials. This exhibit a wealth of remarkable properties, including high surface area, mechanical properties, chemical stability, and quantum confinement. The challenge is how we can make the 2D materials in a large scale production. Continuous hydrothermal flow synthesis uses water at supercritical conditions and involves mixing of water at critical conditions with relevant precursors. The portfolio of materials synthesized by a CHFS include uh, various nano 2D composites from graphene, maxine, boronitride, silver graphene with antibacterial properties, as well as modifying the surface of graphene with metal oxide to provide uh, catalyst materials for CO2 utilization. Continuous hydrothermal flow synthesis offers a variety of control of parameters, so with temperature, pressure, and uh, tunability of flow rate, tunability of residence time, and consequently the processes that, uh, the synthetic processes that are done in lengthy period of time in CHFS, this has been delivered within fraction of a second. An increase in the energy demand of a fast growing world population is one of the challenges faced by the energy industry today. Technological advances in wearable electronics and the ever growing presence of the Internet of Things has increased demand for high performance flexible antenna. One of the biggest challenges of this century is to provide sustainable and affordable potable water. The optimized conversion or renewable biomass and was related to component into useful carbon-based nanomaterial is one of the biggest challenges for sustainable world. Power more oil from the reservoir, we use enhancer, but the conventional enhancer are way too expensive and can cause a huge environmental damage. My project aims to make CHFS-derived materials with tunable and optimized properties to obtain high-performance capacity charge storage properties, such as high energy and power density, as well as psychic stability. Conductive 2D materials are potentially revolutionary antenna materials, allowing for ultra-thin and flexible antennas, not possible with current antenna materials. My work involves synthesizing and characterizing novel 2D materials, including maxine and graphene composites, and implementing these materials in designs for flexible antennas. In our group, we are developing and testing membranes using 2D materials such as graphene and graphene derivatives for water treatment processes. The aim of the research is to design and engineer carbon quantum dust from biomass with excellent optical and structural properties 
by using continuous hydrothermal process. Uh, this new clean, rapid single step continuous hydrothermal process will create a new approaches for synthesizing carbon quantum dust. My project is to using carbon quantum dust derived from sugar, which is a clean and uh, cheap resource as an enhancer to produce more oil from the reservoir. To achieve this, I studied the impact of carbon quantum dust on oil water property and send them through the co-flooding system to see the actual oil uh, additional oil recovery. Nano! Two! So this is it. Uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, for having the time to, to see a bit of research overview of Nano 2D Lab. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Swayla. That was fascinating and, and really great to see your team there. And congratulations on your award nomination. That sounds wonderful. So uh, fantastic work. Um, before you go, actually, I was going to ask, is there one particular material you're most interested in or that you think is going to have or hopefully have a, a huge amount of impact in the world? Well, at the moment, the group uh, research is focusing on uh, 2D materials. So this is the, the single layer sheet. So this is based on graphene and then nanocomposites. Uh, it won the Nobel Prize in 2004 uh, for the discovery of, of, you know, this amazing material. And we've been applying in various areas of, of you know, for energy storage, water treatment, as you did see it in, in the video uh, and wireless communications. So we hope uh, the future in materials engineering will, will be a bit brighter. Thank you very much, Suela. Thanks a lot. Uh, so the next talk is from LSVU design engineer, Christina Kerwin. Uh, Christina will be discussing her work on data centers and the circular economy. Christina. Hi, thank you. Hi, um, well, I'm Chris, and I would like to introduce you to SIDASI project, driving sustainability in the data center industry. I work as a research assistant for SIDASI project here at LSBU. SIDASI is a three-year Interreg funded project that runs across five countries in Northwestern Europe and is piloted by LSBU. And I'd like to point out that there are quite a few female professionals involved in the project across the board. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a former LSB engineering product design student. I graduated in 2017, but carried out um, on studying for a master's. And in 2019, I returned to LSBU to work as a research assistant on sustainability related projects. And I love my job. So the project I work on, SIDASI, is about integrating circular economy to the data center industry. But what is circular economy? Well, um, current economic model is linear and it creates depletion of natural resources, waste and pollution. We basically take natural resources, uh, make products, use them and dispose of them. Many products are designed to fail, so more can be sold for profit and this practice creates a lot of toxic waste. The alternative is circular economy. Well, um, circular economy can be described in the way our ecosystem functions. Um, if you think throughout the life cycle, everything in nature gets repurposed. And at the end of life, things get broken down into raw materials and this then cycle repeats. So circular economy is a better economic model and ensures sustainable future 
uh, resource efficiency. It stimulates a uh, reduction of waste through better waste management and increase in resource reclamation and reuse of raw materials. It also brings about eco-innovation and sustainable business. So um, Sidasi, uh, at Sidasi, we look at the life cycle approach to the whole um, problem of the data center industry generated e-waste and critical raw material recovery. We work on stakeholder collaboration, run co-creation workshops and promote uh, product reuse and refurbishment. We also work uh, with policymakers on eco-design guidelines and we are developing an online tool called um, Circular Data Center Compass, which is based on multi-step lifecycle approach. So why data centers? Well, um, data centers are crucial uh, for the national infrastructure. They process and manage digital data across every part of our society and contribute millions to the economy. There are many different types of data centers, all different um, uh, shapes and different sizes. Um, and the industry is fast growing. And there are approximately 8.4 million data centers around the world. And this figure is expected to grow five times by 2030. Uh, the problem is that the equipment has very short life, lifespan and recycling rates are relatively low. So the industry contributes heavily to global e-waste. And which is already a big problem. So basically data centers are a cluster of uh, servers in, in a space that can be small or huge. And servers are integral parts of it. These machines are high spec computers designed for data processing and storage. And technically, if you look at them, um, they're metal boxes full of complex electronics. Um, the prime focus of server design so far has been on um, operation and performance because of the demand for 24 seven uninterrupted service. And current design differs significantly between models and generations, which doesn't fit well with um, circular design idea because parts cannot be easily uh, reused or repaired. On average, um, equipment use cycle can be anything between one to four years and often shorter than longer. At the end of life, the equipment is treated as e-waste and undergoes several complex separation processes. And during uh, these processes, a high volume of material is being lost. At the moment, only precious metals and limited number of critical raw materials are being recovered from this uh, waste source. So there is a huge potential to improve the lifespan of hardware through circular design thinking and to turn this e-waste into a useful resource of raw materials. Um, my role um, as a researcher at SIDASI is to work on the design and manufacturing aspects of the equipment in collaboration with our um, project partners. A lot of my work involves working in the lab with physical servers and looking for the ways to make the equipment more circular using eco-design guidelines and taking a whole life cycle approach. And I also deliver primary and secondary research and you can see my lab in the photo on the right. Um, in August, um, I present initial results from our original research on life cycle assessment of air-cooled versus liquid-cooled servers at Life Cycle Innovation Conference uh, 2020. Uh, you can see uh, there are quite a few uh, ladies uh, who participated, ladies professionals, so including my manager, uh, Dr. Deborah Andrews, who participated in this in writing this paper. Uh, we highlighted the um, hotspots of the up and coming design solution when it comes to designing for circularity and demonstrated the advantages of using life cycle assessment method to encourage circular design. Our preliminary data showed that at shorter equipment lifespans, the biggest environmental impact comes from the use of resources during the manufacturing stage of the equipment. And this data um, reinforces our argument for extended product life and equipment reuse. Uh, we are also working on the development of SIDASI Eco Design Evaluation Tool to support um, the circular data center compass, an online tool I mentioned earlier. Um, SIDASI, um, uh, the eco-design evaluation tool is a set of consolidated 
EU eco design criteria, together with SIDASI proposed supplementary eco design guidelines, which are based on the empirical data we collected from the assessments of the different server models. This tool makes it easier for the designers to follow the guidelines because everything is reorganized in one place. Basically, it's an eco design checklist that helps determine whether the designed equipment is in line with the EU eco design regulations. Well, um, I would like to conclude that I can see the research as one of the most rewarding um, um, jobs and roles in our society. To me, research means to explore and find answers to the unknown, um, to increase and fill gaps in the knowledge that drives human progress. And um, as a researcher, I'm very proud to be part of something bigger. I know that I have a chance to positively impact on the future of our planet. And this is why I love my job, um, because it really has a meaning. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to find out more about Sedasi Project, please visit our website, www.sedasi.org. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was really interesting. And um, I mean, it's, it's it's not surprising, but it's really shocking that that there's so much waste coming from just that industry. Uh, I love the analogy that you have with the reuse uh, in nature for the circular economy. Um, but given what you've just said about um, you know, wanting to make an impact in your research, making an impact, is that what attracted you to sustainability as a subject in research? Um, I've always been quite passionate about sustainability and actually when I joined LSBU as a student I first met Deborah and she, she, she then she was my um, lecturer um, and so she had a huge impression on me and I've always aspired to, to, to work in design but design for sustainability so yes it's the, it's the role I always aspired to be in. And so it was another woman who was inspiring you uh, in design to, to involve that. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. That's, that's uh, fascinating. Um, right. So next, I'm really pleased that we have a guest from Middlesex University. Uh, Alejandra gonzalez Baez is here to discuss her work exploring the ways that we can use microorganisms to help us with the growing levels of electronic waste that we've just been hearing about. Alejandra. Hello, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start to share my screen now. I hope you can see it. Okay, um, Alejandra, I'm actually an industrial engineer. It wasn't my first choice, to be honest. I was starting to be an economist, I didn't enjoy it at all. So I moved to engineering and I, I really liked it. I'm currently doing a PhD part-time at Middlesex University and I'm also working there as laboratory technician. And today I would like to talk to you about my research project, which is about the recovery of rare earth elements from electronic waste. But before I start with the presentation, I would like to to ask you a question. So we will launch a polling question. And so I think you can see it now on your screens. If you would like to reply, that would be good. Okay, wow. <laughs> this is very interesting. You see that 85% of us still have some old devices at home. So we can close the results now and I will move on with my presentation. So the reason why I ask you this question is just to make you a bit aware of what's happening with, with all these electronics that we are using. We know that every year there are new devices coming, they are faster, they are lighter, and we want them, right? And the thing with these electronics is that we don't really know when, when they, where they are actually going. So unfortunately, most of this electronic waste is not being recycled and almost 80% ends up in landfills or is shipped to developing countries 
you can see the picture at the bottom on the right is an actual open burning site where people are burning this e-waste in order to recover copper. And this is quite dangerous for the people that are doing it and also for the environment because uh, besides valuable materials in e-waste, there are also very dangerous uh, components. There are heavy metals like lead and cadmium. So the idea is to try to stop these things from happening and increase the recycling of e-waste and find alternatives for, for this very fast growing waste stream. So in this research project, I'm actually focusing on waste printed circuit boards. PCBs, they are everywhere. They are in your mobile phones, they are in the laptops, in all the telecom equipment in the offices. So the way how these PCBs are conventionally recycled is by first they are disassembled from the equipment, then they are crushed or they are crushed or shredded into very, very small particle sizes to then be sent for the recovery of the metals. Around 70% goes to smelters. This means that they are born to recover copper mainly, or they can also be sent for chemical leaching where precious metals are recovered. But these practices are bad for the environment. They require a lot of energy and they produce a lot of toxic waste. So there is another way, which is bio leaching. Bioleaching uses microorganisms to leach out these valuable materials instead of using strong chemicals. And this is why I am focusing on bioleaching in this research. However, I am not interested in gold or palladium, even if they are so expensive and attractive. I'm interested in rare earth elements Rare elements are actually very, very critical for modern and future technologies. Elements like neodymium, dysprosium, praseodymium, all of, all of these are rare earths. And they, thanks to these elements, is that we now have very light devices, faster devices, and they are also critical for green energy technologies. Actually, that, that's why you can see here the picture of the small wind turbine. These turbines are more efficient nowadays thanks to the use of neodymium, for example. Unfortunately, we are not recycling these elements. We are, they are not being recycled. And if they are mined from the primary ores, from primary sources, they produce a huge environmental impact. So I'm trying to recover these particular elements from from a secondary source such as electronic waste. The way a bioleaching experiment is set up is quite straightforward. The microorganisms, they, they grow in liquid medium. After a few days of growing, some electronic waste is added. In this case, is crush printed circuit boards. Once they are in contact, they, after several days of the, of the contact, the leaching solution is collected. You can see some examples on the right-hand side. There are some pictures of the actual bio-leaching experiment. So I'm using fungi. And then the leaching solution is collected and analyzed. To do this, I isolated few fungal strains from a contaminated site. This is... Uh, a whole process, a whole microbiology uh, process, which I'm not explaining here in detail, but basically I isolated uh, fungi that were able to survive this very toxic environment like e-waste and that they were able to, to do some leaching of rare elements. So I analyzed 14 rare elements in total I am sharing with you only a few of them, the ones that I have mentioned previously that are so, so important, excuse me. You can see on the y-axis on the left, 
there is the percentage of each element that was recovered in the leaching solution. So they were in a solid state in this e-waste. Then with the help of microorganisms, we were able to solubilize them and, and recover them in, in the liquid solution. You can see from this graph, strain number 20, which is actually that pretty little green thing on the Petri dish, that strain has been doing very well. It has been able to leach around 50% of neodymium and around 40% of prasodymium and gadolinium. After, after this, after finding which strains are the most, um, which strains perform the best. The next steps on this research will be to investigate the mechanisms of action. This means to try to understand how these microorganisms are able to do, to do this, how they are able to solubilize these, these elements from the electronic waste. Is this because they are producing organic acids? Is because they are reducing pH? How, how they are doing? What other metabolites are involved in the process? And this is important to understand in order to optimize the process, in order to move from that 50% perhaps to 100%. So these are the next steps in the project. I'm really looking forward to do this. It's a lot of hard work, but I really enjoy doing research. And that's all for now. Now I just would like to say thank you for being here, for listening. I really hope you enjoy. And I would like to say special thanks to all the women that have encouraged me and that they have influenced my career in science and engineering from my mom to my lecturers, my teachers, my colleagues, and of course, my supervisors in this project. And thanks to the companies that provided the e-waste material. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alejandra. That was a, also a really fascinating talk that was so interesting and um, you know, nice to see the, 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 the actual fungus there, the random green splodge. That was great. Um, that poll you started with was really revealing. Um, is that a common issue? Do you think that most people have uh, large amounts of electronic waste uh, that you're finding as part of the research? Yes, actually. You know, I was uh, really looking forward to do this poll in here because you can actually see the, re the results. When you do it with public, they just raise their hands, but you cannot really count. And according to a recent study, our, there were like around 40 million devices in UK homes and people are stockpiling them and they are full of very uh, rare materials that we need to start to recycling. So people need to start to take them out of the drawer, that Nokia that has been there for 10 years. And because we need to, to start to, to recover the things that are in there in order to stop using primary resources. Great message. Thank you very much, Alejandra. That's brilliant. Um, so you. moving on, sorry. Yep, good. Um, moving on to our last speaker, Dr. Caterina Marquez is going to be telling us all about her work uh, at LSBU on the Green Skies Project. Uh, Kat. Thank you, Claire. I'll just uh, share my screen with you. So just bear with me. Okay, hopefully you're seeing the presentation. Uh, so just before I go into my research, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of my um, work experience in engineering. So my first degree was in food engineering, and which I completed in 2005. And after that, I did a placement at a university in Berlin um, where I was investigating a, a new technology for beer fermentation. So it was fantastic. There was free beer every day. 
And then I came to the UK in 2006 to do a placement at Bristol University. So this was my introduction to refrigeration and it led to a job with Adanda Refrigeration as a testing engineer. So fast forward to 2008, I started a PhD at London South Bank University. And this was an industrial case award PhD. So I was working at Adanda while I was doing the PhD. And it was, in a sense, the best of both worlds because I was doing academic research and I was working in the industry at the same time. And I liked it so much that I did two other KTPs uh, with LSPU and Adande. So one was on acoustics and the other was on developing a cabinet that could eat food, uh, heat, warm up food and also cool it down. And um, Again, fast forward to 2015, I was managing the Adanda engineering department, developing new products. And I was also involved in writing test standards, international and European test standards. But I started to miss a bit academia again. So I came back to LSPU in 2019. And I'm now working in research, but on uh, research on energy and heat networks. So it was a slight career change. So coming into this presentation, I'm going to present about intelligent energy networks. Uh, so uh, this is a Innovate UK project, uh, Innovate UK funded project with 15 partners. Uh, it's called Green Skies, which stands for Green Smart Community Integrated Energy Systems. So this is quite a mouthful. That's why we call it Green Skies. And just a bit of a background uh, to the research. Uh, so the government clean growth strategy that sets a significant role for energy that works um, is quite key and the other policy is about uh, reaching um, zero emissions for vehicles. So currently the target is 2040, but is likely to be reduced to 2030. We're still waiting on the government to announce that. But these policies are part of the UK strategy to be um, carbon neutral by 2050. Now, um, transport, Transport and heating together, they represent 64% of the UK total carbon emissions. So these two sectors are quite key to decarbonize. So just a bit more into how this fits with Green Skies. So um, Green Skies is a concept for an integrated heat, power and transport network. Uh, the infographic shows the key aspects of the project. So this is what we call a fifth generation energy network. Um, it uses a water loop at ambient temperature to share heating and cooling between buildings. And because this is a, a very low temperature network, we can recover waste heat from local sources. And in this case, it can be a heat recovery from the tube, or from a data center. And what we do with this low grade heat is that we upgrade it using heat pumps to provide heating and domestic hot water to the buildings in the district heating network. And in the process, we, call, we cool the tube and we cool the data center. So it's a win-win for all involved. Uh, so the other aspect of the network is that we generate power using solar PV. Uh, we use, um, we store the energy in batteries, uh, we power homes and we can, we are using a new technology which is called vehicle to grid. And this is where we can um, store energy in the car batteries and use it to power the network during peak times. So the whole system is controlled by artificial intelligence that provides the demand side response. So for instance, um, at peak times when energy is expensive, we can switch off the heat pumps and when renewable energy is available, we can switch on the heat pumps and charge autonomous storage. So we get a more 
uh, efficient system overall. So we did a feasibility study last year and we have some results from it. So we looked at the system performance and we were comparing it against a baseline with existing gas boilers. And we looked at different scenarios. So we looked at adding the heat pumps, the thermal storage, the solar PV, vehicle to grid and bespoke batteries. So we looked at all these different scenarios to check what would be the impact on the system. And the results show 80% carbon savings compared to using gas boilers as is current practice today. So these results are very promising. Um, the feasibility studies showed a, a significant reduction on carbon emissions, and this can lead to improved air quality as well, because we are displacing gas boilers and we are displacing diesel and petrol cars. The scheme also generates some revenue savings and it tackles fuel poverty because it would provide um, a reduction on the energy bills for the end users. So this was the feasibility study and now we are into the detailed design that is going to carry out, carry on for another year and a half. And we now established a more clear vision of we, what we want to achieve and we call it the five C's. So basically the aim is to deliver low cost, clean energy to the local community. And we want to develop a system that is going to be constructed and also copied in other cities across the UK and beyond. So this is hopefully a template for smart energy networks around the country. So just a bit of where we are now, this is how the network looks like in, in the London borough of Islington. It's still under development, but this is what it looks like now. So you can see the thick red line, which is the ambient loop uh, connecting all the buildings. And the blue buildings are the ones connected to the ambient loop. The red ones are just satellite buildings that have a, a higher ambient a higher temperature connection. And another thing we're doing is engineering value into the system. So um, the heat network pipes, they're normally underground and the trenching cost in London is about two and a half grand per meter. So it's extremely expensive. And we're looking at, at alternative solutions. And one of those is to actually have the pipes above ground, like in this illustration on the left. So um, we can actually have planters at the side of the road that disguise these heat network pipes. So this is a, a good solution that actually makes the city greener, literally. Um, and the best thing is we can share the civils with them so that the heat network pipes can share the common space with the electric cabling that is going to power the electric vehicle charging points. So again, a win-win situation. So I just have um, like a one minute video that really brings the project to life. So I'm just gonna Share that now. Green Skies is a revolutionary smart local energy system that aims to reduce carbon emissions and tackle fuel poverty in the London borough of Islington. The project will help Islington Council achieve its ambition of being a net zero carbon borough by 2030. Green Skies aims to deliver low carbon heat, cooling and power to an estimated 33,000 residents and nearly 70 local businesses in Islington, whilst also helping to power the growing demand for electric vehicles. Green Skies addresses head-on the issue of fuel poverty by lowering energy costs for thousands of Islington residents whilst reducing carbon emissions and improving air quality for everyone. Green Skies offers a more efficient and future-proofed way to meet our energy needs. Imagine a new, sustainable way to supply transport, heat, cooling and power across cities in the UK and beyond. Green Skies, the future of energy developing before our eyes. 
hope you enjoyed the video. And this is the consortium that is behind this project. So it's quite a large consortium with uh, yeah, 15 companies. And thank you, that's it from me. Thank you very much, Kat. That was, again, a, a wonderful talk that was really interesting. Um, I, I, the green planter idea, um, I thought was amazing. It was a brilliant engineering solution. Uh, really simple, but um, hugely effective. As you say, saving so much money for the local authority, that's brilliant. Um, I have one question before we move on to the panel discussion for you. Um, you said the UK aims to be carbon neutral by 2050, and Islington is, were claiming that they could trying to do it by 2030, I think that video said. Um, do you think we can do it? Do you think we could do it sooner? What do you think? <laughs> I think it's, it's a good ambition to have because it, it propels the council to um, support these kind of projects that they really need the support and, and they need the support from local authorities, otherwise they would never get off the ground. This is something that we found quite critical. So working with a borough that has experience on heat networks and that has this high ambition to be carbon neutral by 2030, it's, it's quite critical and it's, it's exciting to work with them on, on this project. Thank you very much. And that's, uh, that's a great positive answer. It's uh, good to hear that, that people are trying to change the world for the better. Um, now, uh, if I could invite everybody, actually, all of our, panel, uh, all of our um, speakers back, uh, we're going to move to the panel section of the evening. Um, if anybody uh, has any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom so you can ask any questions you have for any of our panelists or all of our panelists. Um, thanks to everybody for those fascinating talks on your work. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions coming in. Um, before we go to those though, um, I have a question. Uh, so if we could invite everybody back. Wonderful, thank you again. Um, yeah, before we move on to other people's questions, um, I wanted to ask if you thought there were, as women working in academic research, engineering research, uh, do you think there are any barriers to women working in this industry? Um, so we start with Kat. Okay, <laughs> thanks Claire. Um, I, personally, I haven't experienced uh, these barriers. Um, but having worked in refrigeration, uh, it has been quite interesting in that sense, because as you said earlier in your presentation, there's like 12% of uh, women working in um, engineering, while in refrigeration is around 2%. So seeing uh, a woman is, is very rare. And, and the Institute of Refrigeration started a working group that is women in refrigeration, air conditioning and heat pumps. And when we started the group, um, we received some comments from males in the industry saying like, but uh, is the group gonna have what, five, 10 people? Well, three years later, we have at least 700 people on LinkedIn. So it is, it is actually having an impact at changing people's perceptions. And that is great. Uh, things that we do is, um, having profiles of women working in the industry. And I think that is helping changing the perception, which is great. Uh, Christina, did you have uh, uh, any barriers you thought were you'd come, uh, come across or, or none? Um, so I'd probably agree with Kat that not as a researcher um, in, um, in the research field, I, I haven't had any barriers, um, but I would like to point out that data center industry is quite a male dominated industry. And we've been to um, exhibitions and conferences that would probably be like 80% male uh, in terms of visitors. So um, it, it is, I think, an under, underrepresented part of the engineering. Uh, Swayla. Uh, what I think is all about having the right platform from the start, a supporting platform is, is for since you're little to going to, you know, secondary school and universities about having your, you know, supporting family, uh, supporting partners is supporting uh, friends and colleagues and above all having a supporting employers that, you know, make sure that 
you know, not only stereotyping, but you progress further to your career. And the only thing it is for as a woman or as an engineer is having resilience and uh, excelling in, in, in life. And role models is one important uh, feature and parameters. And it's been uh, every time it's come across as the woman is, or the engineering is a male dominated uh, field and the lack of role models is one of the reason many women they tend not to go into engineering is also about not having much flexibility uh, and we're not talking about academia we're also talking about engineering as an industry and uh, those flexibilities is as they call it is the pipeline or leak pipeline so many women tend to take engineering as a degree however throughout their career they they drop out of engineering because there is no much flexibility and they have to juggle family with with the demands of career and uh, there that's why they support the family support it, it comes in place and anything else so once one failed then you have the other on the other hand so to make to to make it uh, the challenge less challenging yeah, so you think it's all about the support of others. And that's interesting because Alejandra, you you raised that earlier. You you said thanks to to a number of women who'd given you a great deal of support. Can you um, talk about that? Yeah, um, I think that as Suela just said, role models, it's, it's something that I, I'm sure Christina also mentioned how uh, she got inspiration by one of her lectures. And having that image of what women can accomplish really push you, really gives you that, that push, yeah, like this is also possible. Um, it's not just STEM in general, it's, it's not just for men. You can see so many women accomplishing so much that you get that motivation. The problem I think is that we are not showing that. We are, I, I mean, I'm just gonna give you an example. Just before I joined the, the event, I received an invitation for a conference. The, the invited speakers, those are the ones why people usually attend conferences as well, because there are very good speakers. They were all male <laughs> and I, I was quite surprised. So I said, okay, maybe it's because, it's the, it's because of this pandemic, they didn't manage to get enough women as speakers. So I went to the website to check for the speakers from last year to find out that only seven out of 23 of the speakers were women. So it made me think, we are there. The problem is that for some reason, we are, we are not being invited. We are not being shown. I guess that's, that's why I find this event so important. We need to show the world. Thank you. And, and, and uh, yeah, I've been really pleased to invite everybody here today to show their work. And, and, and it's interesting, actually, what you say about role models, because um, I was asked years ago if I had a, a female sort of engineering role model. At the time, I was like, no, I don't think so, because, um, you know, my boss was a man and, and the people I've worked with directly were mostly men. And then I realized that it was nonsense because my grandmother had inspired me hugely when I was a child, because although she was a housewife for most of her life, she was actually um, she worked as an electrician all the way through the Second World War. So I have her, I have downstairs, I still have her notes uh, that she worked on. Uh, so all of her um, learnings that she did around electricity and electrical uh, circuits, and she rewired my house. Um, and, and so I grew up with that as normality and, and so much so that I didn't even see it as an engineering role model. It was just, it was just my grandmother and what she'd done, which I thought was interesting. Um, before I move on again, I just have one more question um, for everybody. And that is um, a number of people here. I think everybody here were, mentioned a team of people that they're working with. And I, I think of modern engineering as being extremely collaborative. Um, how do you find collaborating with large numbers of people or different groups? Do you think it's a really great thing to do? Do you find it easy to do? And um, again, as a woman, do you find there's any issues around that or, or, or none at all? Um, we'll start with uh, Suela. Oh, you, uh, we need your microphone on, Suela. 
Well, is, as every discipline is, is everything needs to be multidisciplinary. You can't survive on your own. And is that's one of the best benefits of, of being a, a engineer or materials engineer. You, you, for instance, for in our group, we make the materials and we need to find someone to apply those materials and we need someone to do the modeling and predict what those materials would be. So it, it, it's kind of having the full loop and that full loop or integrated approach it only through collaborative works through not only engineering but different various fields from uh, biomedical to chemistry uh, to uh, physics and etc so it is great you have the opportunity to collaborate alternatively no one will be able to survive uh, without those opportunities and yes, about and not be able to deliver in, in a bigger impact Agreed. And, and Alejandro, actually, it's interesting because you mentioned you were uh, looking at the economics before you did engineering. So do you find you use that knowledge in your work as an engineer and a scientist now? Oh, microphone again. Sorry, uh, you mean the, the knowledge from... From, from uh, your economics background? Well, uh, yeah, actually, I always like maths. I love numbers. I remember getting excited every time that I was finding what X, what was the X answer, you know, X equal 10. Oh my God, in high school, I got very excited for those silly things. And yeah, I think that that helped me a lot through engineering. You know, there is a lot of calculus and I really enjoyed it. And that's what I, I keep saying to my niece every time that she asks me for help with the maths work. I tell her, you can do it as well. Is You just have to keep going, studying, and, and you can also do it. And that, that's interesting because that echoes something that, that um, Linda Large, uh, who, who formed uh, in the 1980s, the, the Women Engineering Center at London South Bank, she said one of the things she was continually hearing um, uh, when she was at our launch event for this program, she said that continually women were being told, oh, maths is really hard, physics is really hard. And, and she's, she basically said, no, it isn't. You just have to learn it. You just have to work at it like anything. And, and she wanted to, people to stop hearing those words as though it would, it would put everybody off. Um, so, Christina, actually, you're working as part of a, a large collaborative um, effort, Chris. So how do you find that working as part of that collaboration? Well, um, I, I mean, to me, engineering cannot happen just if one person works. So you have to have a team. Uh, anything that's well, as a design engineer as well, I look at the things that are made and designed. Uh, nothing in the world is created by one person. The idea might be, but development of it requires a, a large gr group, large team of people. So I, I, I thrive in, in teamwork, so I absolutely love large projects. And uh, Kat, do you have the same experience with this collaboration? Because again, I mean, yours is even bigger than, than I think any of us. It's, it's a huge um, collaboration. Yeah, it's massive. 15 companies, uh, well, 14 companies, the university is over 50 people at, um, at meetings sometimes. <laughs> and my role in the project is uh, as a project manager, right? I'm mostly, um, I'm doing some research, but I'm mostly the, the project manager. So, so I, I need to reach out to, to everyone, really. But I, we developed such a fantastic team because everyone gets along really well. And we have a lot of specialists in the, their fields, but the, um, to make such a complex system work, so you need to integrate these different subjects. So people are always keen to learn from others because no one holds all the answers. So it makes it quite exciting, quite dynamic. And there's a huge range of, um, there's a lot of women, different ages, uh, different cultural backgrounds. So it makes it a quite dynamic and interesting project, really. That's really good to hear. Um, so we have some questions coming in. Uh, firstly, um, for Chris and uh, Alejandro, I guess, um, related to recycling of electronics, uh, do we have companies in the UK who recycle electronics? And if so, um, can we make the university a drop-off point? But, but yeah, uh, what are the options for recycling the e-waste at the moment? Shall I? Um, Whoever 
Chris, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I've I looked can follow you. Okay. Um, uh, there is actually a website called recycleyourelectricals.org.uk that uh, basically you put in your postcodes and it tells you where your nearest collection point is. That's in, in terms of finding a collection point. But yes, there, there's a lot of companies that, um, especially commercially in terms of uh, um, so, uh, data center industry, there are companies that buy um, electronic waste and recycle it and um, um, then sell it off, well, sell it off to uh, buy leaching companies. Uh, or leaching um, the uh, uh, mat raw material recovery companies. Um, one of them um, is one of our part. Well, quite a few of our partners um, are involved in this. Um, so yeah, there, there are. Yeah, I have another website. You can, I mean, you can use uh, different links. I I am actually sending it here in, in the chat so everyone can have it. You, as Christina said, this one works the same way. You just put your postcode and then it's gonna tell you where is the closest recycling point. Uh, there are other alternatives. What I was doing before, for example, was whatever phone my father was changing, he was getting a new one, I was getting the old one. I never bought a mobile phone until I was 30, I think because I was always using whatever someone was not using anymore until I didn't have anyone to give me a used phone, so I had to buy a new one. So that's also something that you can do. If the phone is working, give it to someone else, bring it to charity, or if it's working, of course, or if you want to make some money, there are some places like, uh, I think it's called Carphone. They actually get all monies, all, all funds, and then you can get some money for them if they are that's good of course so there's there's lots of opportunities for this and and in in respect to the question where they were saying is it possible to make for example the university a drop-off point for those sorts of things is that an, an option or is that just just too complicated hmm. well i guess that that's gonna be up to the university admin, I, I don't know, they need to arrange this. Uh, here at Middlesex, for example, we have many drops for batteries. So they are all around the campus. You can bring your batteries and then you just leave them there and they get collected. But I, I don't know like who will do that arrangement. That needs to come from management, I think. You can't just have one outside your laboratory and then, and then a blender. <laughs> To, to make that direct, directly into your lab. Well, no, it's not that easy, unfortunately. Um, there is another question coming. Um, uh, so uh, to each of you, uh, and I'll name in a moment, but what is your most memorable moment as uh, a woman in the industry? Um, it could be that you were surprised or challenged or inspired by somebody. Um, Kat? Oh, now I'm fit on the spot. Uh, <laughs> that that's all right, take your time, it's okay. Yeah, no, that's a difficult one. Uh, so can you go back to that? So what, a moment so what that was, was your most memorable moment? Um, were you surprised or challenged or inspired by somebody? Hmm. Well, I've been inspired by the presentations today. So these kind of events really help and uh, going to conferences and learning what's new is difficult to pinpoint an exact moment. Um, I remember when I was back in the day when I was a test engineer, I was always very excited to try something new and come the following day and try to prove or disprove my theory and look at the results. But these are just day-to-day -day small inspiration moments rather than big ones. So hmm, I'll have to think better about this one. <laughs> but do you think that those that that it's that's the the sort of the small together that or each of those moments has helped kind of reinforce what you want to do? I think so. I think so. It's the build up, and 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 I think the sense of being part of something bigger, 
uh, doing research that is related to reaching net zero carbon. I mean, that, that's quite inspiring in itself. You feel like you're designing the future. So just thinking on the larger picture is inspiring and then break it down to what you're doing on your day to day. Thank you. And, and Suela, do you have a, a most memorable moment? You were surprised or challenged? Well, I have to say, I guess, is a failure in the lab uh, when I thought I had made this, uh, well, was graphene material, which actually through our process, we can cut it into very small size particle and it fluorescent under UV light. So I was super excited a few years back. I thought I had made this material uh, in a continuous process and uh, told everyone on the way uh, to, to my office or to, to home. And later in the night, I was thinking, I was lying down in the bed and just thinking, and then I realized I was like, but I did not test the water and the tube alone. So I went next morning just to figure out that the centrifuge tube, I had my material was fluorescent. So actually I had not made anything. Uh, and it took me nearly three months. I didn't give up until I made that material. And when I think about it, it's, it's kind of those, you know, not only success, but those failures uh, are, tend to be, they are memorable moments because uh, they make you work harder and you show resilience and it's, it's kind of determination, which that's what all engineering is all about, is finding a solution to a problem. Thank you. And you're, you're so right. Failure is, is, is not only um, part of engineering, it's, 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 it's an inherent necessary thing uh, in engineering research. And in, and in fact, in all research, as, as we're exploring uh, really the frontiers of the new and creation, uh, uh, then actually, thank you, Suela, for sharing that, that, that failure, because I know, I'm, I know looking around here, um, anybody who's done research, anyone who's done a PhD is, is very familiar and uh, um, even comfortable, I would, I would say, with failure after a while, because it is so inherently part of, of, of what we do. Um, Chris, do you have a moment that really stands out? Um, uh, it, it, sorry? <laughs> I, I agree with uh, Kat that um, it's, it's a difficult question. Um, I think it's the same as being a part of something bigger, a part of a project that is uh, building the future is probably the most um, memorable part well, of my life. So uh, I, I am involved in something I love doing. So, and, and in terms of inspiration, um, I've got um, a daughter whom I think I inspire just by being an, an, an engineer in research and, you know, she will take after me to follow my footsteps or look at me as an example. Thank you. That's a lovely, that's a lovely idea. And I, I hope, I hope she does. We need more women in engineering. Um, so Alejandra as well, do you have one uh, time or, or one thing that inspired you uh, or, or challenged you a memorable moment? Um, well, <laughs> as, as some of you already said, yeah, it is a difficult question. Um, I guess that it happened when I came here to the UK. I, I left my home country as an industrial engineer and I came here to work in a coffee shop. And that was a bit shocking for me at the beginning. You know, I, I had to start from zero. So I guess that that moment when I got into the university and I got that job, I thought I am back in track. I am back to my roots, to what I really love. And that kind of, at that time I was thinking it is worth, I mean, you put a lot of effort in everything. And if you continue, you, you keep working hard, then you, at some point you, you will manage to, to get what you are working for, what, what you are trying to achieve basically. So, so just as, as Swoyla was saying earlier, it's, it's about having resilience and about knowing that um, actually it's a great industry to work in. You get to be part of some incredible projects and, and it's worth yeah. persevering those. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I have just one more question and we have to be relatively quick, relatively. Um, 
if you could um, propose one thing uh, to encourage engineering students to stay and continue through and stay in engineering industry, um, what do you think we could do? Um, we'll stay with Alejandra. Well, first of all, I would tell them we need you. We really need you because we are so, we are few still. We still need to fill up that massive gap. So that would be one thing to say, I guess. And uh, Chris? Um, um, I suppose, um, you know, don't give up. Um, keep on um, grinding that stone of knowledge to achieve what you want to achieve in life and, um, you know, uh, choose what you love doing uh, as your job. Then it will always be, a, you know, a holiday, really. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Kat, what do you think? I mean, just in like practical terms, something that's very easy to do is to just um, take a picture of something, some to share what happened on your day, do a short video. And that's a, a quick way to share on social media how exciting your daily job is. And it's just, it's different than um, people expect. And so you can start bringing, um, breaking down those expectations and showing, oh, well, this in reality, this is quite inspiring. Maybe I should do this. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Swela, to, to finish, is there, is there something that, because I know you have a daughter. Um, so is there something that you would say to try and encourage women into engineering and staying in engineering? Well, it is all about showing that engineering can provide solution and does provide solution to to all of our challenges and uh, knowing that one of the reason women do select engineering is simply because they think they can make a difference and indeed engineering can make a difference in our daily life in you know global contribution so that is one important message through engineering you can provide and you can deliver you can have an impact. Thank you very much, Rayla. That's a really inspiring message to finish on. Absolutely, engineering has huge impact. And, and we all here have shown that, that our work is having an impact, hopefully a positive one on the world as well. So thank you very much. Um, so that brings us to the end of the panel and um, the end of the uh, evening as well. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks again to our wonderful contributors, um, Suela Kalici, Chris Kerwin, Alejandro Gonzalez-Baez and uh, Kamal Kez. Uh, it's been great to hear about their interesting research work that is actually making the world a better place and, and that that's been a real inspiration for them as well and continues to be. Uh, so as this program, our, our next event will be on the 2nd of December in association with DNET, the uh, London South Bank University Staff Network for Disability and Accessibility. We'll be looking at how engineering and design uh, can make a world that works for everyone, uh, no matter their disability or learning difficulty. Um, if you'd like to know more about the program of events, you can email the address that hopefully Dean is going to be sharing now. Uh, every month we're releasing a biography of past LSBU student or staff members, um, women in engineering, and this month's biography is on Carol Maddox, the first woman lecturer in engineering here at LSBU. So I'll enjoy reading that later and um, hopefully Dean is also going to be sharing that with you in the chat as well. You can see all of our videos for our past events and our future events will be on our YouTube channel and our Eventbrite page has details of our LSBU Women in Engineering timeline. Thanks again to all our contributors. Thanks to Dean Woodhouse for his help organising this. And uh, thank you very much to those of you who've intended today. I hope you've really enjoyed it. I know I have. And um, hope to see you next time at the next event in LSBU 100 Women in Engineering. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.